Hi everyone and welcome to the online lecture for this week, uh, next week, which is focusing on stage three of the Canadian practice process framework, which is assess, evaluate. Um, so we've covered this, you hopefully are getting more familiar with this, and we spent a lot of time over the last few weeks just looking at enter, initiate and set the stage, given that um, those are very crucial stages and really enable us to move on to assess, evaluate. Um, and really those top three that are sort of in a line there really form the foundation for a sound, effective um, occupational therapy process and the contact that you have with the client. And so that's why we're spending so much time on them. So moving on to assess, evaluate. The first thing to remember is that by the time we get to this stage, and remember that could be in the first session, um, so it could be within the first half an hour, hour you've seen somebody, or it might take a number of sessions over a number of weeks, and that will depend on the setting you're working in and the client you're working in. But by the time you get to this phase, remember the previous phase, at the end of that, we had an idea of what the occupational issues are for the client. And remember again, could be individual, could be group or community. We'll stick with an individual at this point. So at this stage, the previous stage, set the stage, we know what the occupational issues are. And in the book chapter, um, which talks about this, the example I give is someone called Margaret, um, and the occupational issues her and the therapist have identified, uh, difficulty reading fine print, workplace support in terms of her condition and being able to be at work, and, and some uncertainty about whether or not she'll return to work. Now remember, one of the important things about this previous stage is recognize, or is um, making sure that we actually write them and document them as occupational issues and not as poor vision, for example, in this case. Poor vision is a component level thing. Occupational therapists can't fix a vision, but we can help somebody who's having difficulty reading fine print, for example. So it's important that the occupational issues are named and labelled as occupational issues. However, at this stage, set the stage, we don't really know what the causes are of those occupational issues. We will certainly have some idea, um, and you might want to think about well, how could we have some idea what those occupational issues are resulting from. And it might be things like, for example, we will have a referral or some, of some sort. That could be verbal, it could be written. That will give some hints as to what some of the reasons for these occupational issues are. And also, we've already spent some time and as, as I say, that might vary, but we have spent some time talking to Margaret, in this case, for example, um, and so we will have been asking her questions, observing what she's been doing, how she's moving around, if we're um, depending on where we are. So we'll start to have an idea, but assess evaluated where that really happens. So in terms of the CPPF, the theory of the CPPF is that these are the four things that happen during the assess evaluate stage. So first of all, we assess occupational status, dreams and potential for change. And I think that one is one of those ones that we have been doing. We started at enter, initiate, um, continue during set the stage, and we'll do more of that through assess, evaluate. So what's the current occupational status of the person? What are their strengths, abilities? What are they able to do, not able to do, have difficulty doing? Um, and what are their hopes and dreams for where they might be down the track a bit? Um, and you'll gain some idea about what's the potential for change based on what you know about the client, but also your professional reasoning and judgment. Then the big one really is assessing, evaluating or analysing the person, environment, occupation and how those things are contributing to the occupational issues. And I guess it's important to look at all of those. Again, depending on your setting and the client, some of those might be given more priority than others. Um, but this is where we think about what's going on, how does the person do the occupation, um, what's going on in the environment to support or enable, uh, facilitate or enable their occupation performance and engagement, and what are some of those performance aspects, person aspects, sorry, the um, cognitive, affective, physical, spiritual, um, that might be impacting on their occupation performance engagement. So we re this is where we really get into some of that stuff. But always with a mind to how is that helping us understand the occupational issues that person is facing. Once we've done that, and again, depending on the setting, the client, that could take um, a very short period of time, could be half an hour, an hour, 
or it could be you're seeing this person regularly over a period of time and it might take months before you really get to the bottom of some of that, um, but it will vary. But once you have come to the end of that process of understanding, evaluating the person, environment, occupation, it's time to get all that data together, recognising that might come from a whole range of different sources um, and formats, and then interpreting that data and what me trying to work out what does that mean in relation to the occupational issues that person's having. I think the thing to remember as well here is that we're not, it isn't the case that one tool, assessment or whatever will give us all the information we need. It's likely um, that we will need to undertake a number of different assessment methods, strategies, use a few different tools perhaps um, to really get to grips with what's going on for that person. And so actually that analyse and interpret process stage can be quite complex. And then after that, um, you've got a bit of an idea what's going on. And so then you can start to think about, okay, so these are the occupational issues. These are what seem to be the causes of those occupational issues. What are some possible ideas you might have, we might have, for how to address that so that the person can continue return to um, their occupations? Okay. So again, there's a lot to do. This is quite complex. Um, and... There are lots of different ways to do it, which we'll spend a bit of time talking about in class as well. Just a bit, another word. Um, I know um, terminology is an issue for us, for the profession, and this is no exception. There are a number of terms used in the literature around this assessment process, um, assess, evaluate, and they are used a bit differently depending on largely which country you're in. Screening is one that is fairly commonly used um, and it means the same thing generally across all the countries and screening is that process of working out does this person need, would they benefit from, can I offer them something as an occupational therapist that would be useful. Um, and as we've talked about in the first two stages, those dotted arrows that go down to exit conclude, the screening is that process that we're doing to decide do we continue on to the next stage or do we exit conclude. And so screening in the CPPF happens across all those first three phases. Um, assessment, and and assessment and evaluation are the ones that are used differently. So generally speaking, in some of the American literature, um, assessment yet, um, is referring to a particular assessment method or technique. So it might be the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure would be an assessment, is what they would refer to an assessment, but an assessment might also be an initial interview. And an evaluation is that whole process which includes all of the assessments that you would do for somebody. So evaluation is wrapping them all together. We undertake an, evalu an evaluation process that includes numerous assessments. So that's generally the American way of thinking about things. Um, in Australia, the UK, we would tend to talk, we can talk about assessment being that process. So we undertake a process of assessment with somebody and we might in that um, participate, engage in, complete a number of assessment tools or processes. And evaluation is generally used to talk about the later stages in the CPPF where we're looking back at um, the occupational therapy intervention up until this point and working out if we need to change, continue, stop, modify, go back to the beginning. So evaluation tends to be that later stage um, rather than the way the Americans use it, which is the beginning stages. That may or may, may, or may not make sense, but just to be aware if you're reading, because some of the references I've given you span, not surprisingly, different countries and they do use that terminology um, slightly differently. We'll use it according to the CPPF. So that assess, evaluate is um, what the larger processes and evaluation generally is towards the end. Okay, what are we trying to find out through this whole process? Um, and so in the CPPF, this is the first three stages. Who is this person? Um, and that isn't just who, what's their name, but this is that stuff in that we've been talking about in terms of who is this person as an occupational being? What are their interests? How do they spend their time? What's the meaning behind some of the occupations they engage in? So who is this individual we're talking to and working with, potentially? Does this person need occupational therapy? Is there something that they're having trouble with that I, as an occupational therapist, can support them in um, getting back to or doing? 
Do they have occupational issues and challenges, which is related to that previous one? And then what are the causes of the occupational issue, issues and challenges? So really, over these first three stages of the CPPF, this is all the information we're trying to get out. The issue, however, is that that is actually very complex. And if you just think about that first question, before you even talk about or try to understand occupational issues, let alone the causes of those occupational issues, just understanding for someone as an occupational being can be quite a lengthy process and a detailed, complicated process. Um, and so let's not underestimate that this is a complicated um, process um, that we're going through or trying to go through. Why is it so complex? Claire Hocking, in the reading you've got, um, I, I think has summarised it really succinctly and quite nicely. So first of all, she recognises that occupation, performance and engagement are complex. Um, because we're thinking about the person, the environment and the occupation, so all of those things come together in different ways, each in their own is quite complicated and so that adds to the complexity of assessment. It's also challenging sometimes, and again this depends on the setting, the client, um, but occupational therapists, as you know, try to be client-centred, person-centred. Um, and that can be challenging because, as you know from talking f about the CPPF a few weeks ago, um, the ideal is that we have an equal um, relationship with the client where we are both experts in different things, but we come together for the benefit of the client. And so being client-centred and not being driven by what I think or what my service thinks um, can be difficult. There's also a big push, and you will talk more about this probably next year, to be evidence-based. So to use, to only engage clients in interventions that there is evidence to support. Um, and that can be challenging because there may not be any evidence. There may The evidence may not be very compelling. The evidence may be very compelling, but you don't have the resources. Or there might be evidence, but it doesn't fit within an occupational therapy way of thinking about things. Add all of that into the different social and practice contexts. Um, so thinking again about the CPPF and those outer boxes around the whole process, all of that can put limitations, restrictions, could open up opportunities um, to give you lots of possibilities, and so some decisions have to be made. So there are assessment is complex. There are lots of reasons why it's complex, um, and so we just need to recognise that. Okay, so um, the first three questions are really will largely be dealt with by the previous two stages of the CPPF, but we will continue to understand those things in, the, in this stage. Um, but stage three is really about what are the causes of the occupational issues and challenges that that person is facing. Um, now you already know, have a few tools at your disposal so that you can make some assessment of those things. You know, for example, how to do an initial interview or have developed, are developing that. We've touched on the COPM and we'll do more about that, but it is a way of trying to understand that. You have done, and we've done, did quite a bit of this last semester, on using the CMOP as a structure, just generally to think about things, but also particularly to undertake an occupation analysis. So you could already, without doing any other assessments, start to get, as I said before, in fact, a few ideas as to why is this person having these occupational issues and challenges. But there are other things that we can do. One of the things I just want, oh, this is sort of to step aside, and I've used this photo deliberately so you can try and it sticks in your mind. One of the things that is really an important issue in occupational therapy assessment is um, where do we start and what do we prioritise? And the two things um, that are important to think about are, one is a top-down versus bottom-up approach is the way that it's talked about, and the other one is prioritising occupation over other things, and I'll just talk about those two things briefly, but they're mentioned in the chapter by Claire Hocking. So a top-down versus a bottom-up approach. Um, the top-down approach is thinking at the occupational issues level, and that's the one we are advocating and is more consistent with the contemporary occupational therapy paradigm. Um, so a top-down approach is what are the occupational issues per this person is having or these people are having, and then you move down to what are the causes of that. So then we look at the um, person and the environment particularly to look at what's causing those occupational issues. A bottom-up approach would be the reverse to think about, okay, so this person has had a stroke or has schizophrenia. 
we know that people with either of those conditions has ABC or XYZ. It is likely, therefore, if you move up, to say that they're going to have trouble with this occupation or that occupation. So that's a bottom-up approach. Okay. Um, so in both of those approaches, there is the possibility to address occupation as well as the underlying component causes of the occupational issues. But in a bottom-up approach, it doesn't necessarily follow. And Claire Hocking has written an article, which I've given you the reference for, about occupation-based assessment, where she really clearly articulates that. Um, because she's very clear that, and it makes complete sense, and I've seen it happen lots, is that if you start at the component level, so if you start bottom up, it's very easy to continue focusing on those component issues and lose sight of the occupation that somebody um, wants, needs, or has to do. So top down and bottom up is really important and something for you to think more about. Um, and it's something I write about in one of the chapters I've given you as well. Similarly, there is this idea of uh, and it's related, so these are just sort of two slightly different ways of thinking about these issues, is what's the thing that we prioritise or give more importance or significance to in the occupational therapy assessment process at this stage, um, but it goes throughout the whole OT process. Is it occupation? Is it the components? So I'm talking there particularly about the person components and the environment components. So the physical, the affective, the cognitive, spiritual maybe, and also the environment things. Do we give them more priority? Or do we give the diagnosis priority? So really our prime concern is that this one person has schizophrenia. Um, now, a, um, an approach consistent with the contemporary occupational therapy paradigm would say that we prioritise occupation. And we have talked about this, and it's there are some subtle differences, but it's also a bit complex to think about I think so we'll probably talk more about it but we need to think about these issues because they shape particularly if we allow them um, to guide us in these early stages of the CPPF or any OT process in fact um, the risk is that they can guide us into practice which would not be consistent with the contemporary paradigm. I'd encourage you to have a think about that um, and we can talk more about that perhaps in class but it's important to reflect on. Okay, so in terms of assessments, there are a whole range of assessments you can do, and you'll see on the handout that goes with this lecture, I've given you a few examples. Really broadly speaking, however, that we can, there are review documents, and there are a whole range of documents, again, depending where you're working, but we might have a referral letter, we might have a medical chart, we might have a school report thinking about the primary school we're at. Um, and we can read through those and pick out bits of information that are useful and interesting. Um, we can undertake interviews, and again, you've started to do that. There are different ways we can do those interviews. We've already done very, um, well, probably semi-structured interviews, but also slightly more structured interviews, um, and there are even very formal ways of interviewing people, so there are a number of ways you can do that. We can observe people engaging in occupation um, and make records and, um, and look at try and work out what's going on for them while they're doing that, and there are a number of ways of doing that. Again, some of those are very informal, so we will literally just get Mrs Jones and say, come and make a cup of tea, or let's go out um, for a coffee at the local coffee shop, and while you're doing that, you'll be doing small, having a conversation, making small talk, but you'll be observing what's going on um, and how the person is coping um, with the occupation and any challenges that might arise. Um, and then... There are very formal ways of doing that as well. Um, and then in terms of specific assessment tools, there are hundreds of them. Um, and we generally think about them as being standardised or non-standardised, although some of those things um, can happen in observation as well. But again, I've given you a list of examples, and it really is just there are some names, there are loads more. So there is the River Mead Perceptual Assessment Battery to look at perception. Um, there is the COPNAB, which is a cognition one. There is the Brunings Ozaretsky, which is a paediatric one looking at fine, um, motor skills. So there are a whole range of things. I guess the thing to think about is each one of those will give you a perspective on the person's issues and how they might be impacting on their occupation performance and engagement. It's likely that you would need to do a combination. You wouldn't necessarily need to do all of them, 
but you probably need to do a combination of more than one to get a, a fuller view of that person's occupational issues and the causes for those. Um, and again, some of this will be will largely be dictated by the practice context part of the CPPF in terms of what's available, what's usual practice where you're working. Um, some of the assessments and tools require you to have special training. So that's about you as an individual. If you don't have that training, you can't use it. So there are lots of things that influence this. But you, we need to be thinking about there are a whole range of ways we can understand someone and their occupational issues and the reasons for those occupational issues. I just want to finish with this slide because, as I said, it's really important to think about the relationship between occupation or the place of occupation in this assessment process. Um, and so I want you to think about top down, bottom up and prioritising occupation over other things. OK, that's it for this week or for the online lecture anyway. OK, see you in class.